And the foot posture index was used in a very interesting prospective three-year study published in Spain, looking at over uh, 10,000 healthy children. This is a remarkable large subject pool. And I'm sorry, 1,000 children, 505 boys and 527 girls between the ages of five and 11. And they kind of uh, prospectively followed these children over a three year period and they looked at their foot posture. And indeed, it's a wide range. And indeed, as reported by other experts, foot posture gradually improves over a period of time in growing children. But of interest is what I've drawn in the black circle. And that is the number of children who have highly pronated feet in this study, who remained highly pronated after a three year period, and many of whom remained highly pronated. Growing children. And it shows that the mean foot posture index is not pronated or flat. It's actually so-called neutral. And indeed, it is a wide range in most children under age 10. And there are significant numbers of children with moderate to severe pronated feet in these studies who do not improve and do not move into a normal foot posture by age 10. I've Those are the children that I'm... Checks. And apparently, Again, if we could, go ahead and I'm going to put mute those microphones, please. Right. Wish we could mute the I'm, microphones. Is Thank you. <laughs> Which children with asymptomatic flat foot deformity will go on and develop significant pathologies in their lower extremities later in life? We know that pes planus is linked to many lower extremity pathologies. Most of you are well aware of studies and in your own clinical practice, the relationship between pes planus and hallux abducto valgus, calluses and hammer toes. But I want to focus on this, the progressive collapsing foot deformity, also known as the adult acquired flat foot. In my paper, I changed the definition of this deformity to this newer updated description of a symptomatic progressive flat foot deformity originates from the talocalcaneo navicular joint, which I'll describe in a few minutes, leading to reactive tendinopathy and then loss of integrity of ligamentous structure supporting the joints of the arch and hind foot. This is not posterior tibial tendon dysfunction anymore. We've learned that the posterior tibial tendon is not the primary driving force in both causing or even preventing the adult acquired flat foot. Many studies have shown that the majority of patients who develop the progressive collapsing, disabling adult acquired flat foot report that they had flat feet all of their life. They had flat feet as children, they were asymptomatic, but usually around age 50 or 60, something changed and one or both feet became progressively symptomatic and structurally began to progressively collapse. We previously thought this condition was due to a failure of the posterior tibial tendon. We now know that the posterior tibial tendon reacts to an underlying joint instability. It is not the primary cause, but it's actually the victim of an underlying instability. The term posterior tibial tendon dysfunction was coined in 1989 by Johnson and Strom, who proposed a classification system back then that is still popular today for some unknown reason. Because this system is entirely outdated and incorrect because it attributes the entire progression of the deformity to the integrity of the posterior tibial tendon. A mountain of evidence has accumulated since 1989 showing that it's the ligaments of the midfoot, hind foot and ankle and not a single tendon that accounts for the progressive deformity. One of the most uh, important studies was published by two podiatrists in the United States in the early 1990s. Megan Jennings and Jeff Christensen performed a cadaveric study. And in this study, they showed that the spring ligament complex is the major stabilizer of the arch 
of the foot during mid stance. And that once the spring ligament ruptures, the posterior tibial tendon is incapable of fully accommodating for the insufficiency of the spring ligament. Many studies using magnetic resonance imaging have documented that spring ligament insufficiency is found in most patients who have rupture of the posterior tibial tendon. And in fact, there are many patients with spring ligament insufficiency without posterior tibial tendon rupture, leading to a newer uh, theory that the posterior tibial tendon attenuates and ruptures after insufficiency of the spring ligament and other key ligaments. This recent paper from the UK made this very proposal that the spring ligament complex is the driving force behind the development of the adult acquired flat foot deformity. Recently in 2020, a group of world renowned foot and ankle surgeons gathered and proposed a new classification system and a new name of the adult acquired flat foot, calling it now the progressive collapsing foot deformity. And in their initial paper, they pointed out the fact that the flexible adult acquired flat foot deformity is far more than a rupture of the posterior tibial tendon. Most importantly, it's a rupture of the spring and del deltoid ligaments, which provide the sling and supportive effect to the talonavicular joint. And this must always be taken into consideration when evaluating any patient with adult acquired flat foot. So the question here today is what causes ligaments to rupture, then create reactive tendinopathy and progressive collapse of the foot? An emerging theory is that joint instability precedes failure of multiple ligament structures. And that we've actually now identified anatomic deficits present in infants and children, which are unique and which may actually be linked to the later development of the adult acquired flat foot. The question today is, do some of these ligaments fail to develop in early life? Do the, does the spring ligament fail to fully mature in infants and growing children? And most importantly, can early intervention perhaps promote development of stable ligaments and stable joints? So we're beginning to question and recognize that perhaps younger children have inherent instability of certain joints of their feet that then causes progressive overload of not only tendons, but of the supportive ligaments. And then eventually we see degeneration, rupture of ligaments and rupture of, of specifically the posterior tibial tendon. But we wanna go back and look at what joint or joints are unstable. If I were to ask any of the attendees today which joint they focus on in the progressive flat foot deformity, I would bet most of them would say the subtalar joint. But what I'm asking you to do is to evaluate recent evidence that is focused on not just the talonavicular joint, but the combined talocalcaneonavicular joint. Even Angela Evans, the critic of any treatment of asymptomatic pediatric flat feet does admit in her paper in 2020 that certain children are more likely to develop symptoms with flat foot deformity. And she points out three anatomic or mechanical factors, a valgus heel beyond 10 degrees resting stance position, halo navicular joint coverage angle, which I'm about to show you, greater than 35 degrees. And of course, something that we've all recognized the presence of restricted ankle joint dorsiflexion or equinus. Evans cited this study by Morialda and Scott Mubarak, where they looked at children with symptomatic and asymptomatic flat feet, and they tried to find what parameters separated the two. Of all of the measures they looked at, an X-ray taken of the foot showed that uncoverage of the head of the talus was the number one differentiating feature of symptomatic versus asymptomatic children. This x-ray finding on the anterior posterior x-ray 
where the forefoot is abducted on the rear foot at the talonavicular joint was the key finding separating asymptomatic from symptomatic children. Another paper quoted by Andrew Levins was published by Jan et al, who also found in, in evaluating symptomatic versus asymptomatic children, number one differentiating feature, lateral displacement of the navicular on the head of the talus. So we're looking at this joint here, not the subtalar joint, as the joint that is unstable and is detectable in a growing child most likely to be symptomatic and maybe progress to the adult acquired flat foot. If we read Jan's paper in detail, she quotes a paper by Scarpa who looked at the so-called subtalar joint complex and described the anterior and middle facet of that joint complex as resembling the hip joint and quoting Scarpa as calling this area of the foot the acetabulum pedis because of its similarity to the hip. So this is a, a newer insight in not only into the anatomy, but the, the pathologic function of the foot. And I wanna focus on this structurally because it's quite interesting. This so-called acetabulum or socket is formed by ligaments in the floor and medial wall and by the osseous structure of the navicular. And this round opening or acetabulum or cavity uh, is a recess for the head of the talus. This so-called acetabulum pedis was first described back in 1818 by Scarpa and later by a group of Italian orthopedic surgeon anatomists. In a study by Epiduli published in 1995, looking at um, specimens from stillborn and deceased newborns, they first noted differences among these uh, newborn specimens, or, in, or uh, uh, these were really um, <clears throat> uh, deceased newborns and stillborn infants, that the shape of the acetabulum pedis varied significantly. And depending on the integrity of these ligamentous structures and the osseous alignment, the entire shape of the foot was different. I wanna show you how this may relate to the adult acquired flat foot. And as we look at the gradual breakdown of the uh, adult acquired flat foot in a rotational phenomenon known as the peri taylor subluxation, first described by Sig Hansen and then by several other authors. peri taylor subluxation is a description of the gradual migration of the bones of the foot into dorsiflexion, abduction, and eversion around the talus itself as the adult acquired flat foot deformity progresses. Using weight bearing CT imaging, these researchers recently in 2020 showed that the subluxation of the adult acquired flat foot occurs primarily at the anterior and middle facets of the so-called subtalar joint, not the posterior facet. If they looked at the so-called joint uncoverage of patients with adult acquired flat foot, the primary shift is in the medial facet or middle facet of the subtalar joint, not in the posterior facet. The subluxation is occurring up in this area, which I've previously described as the acetabulum pedis. Further research in the last three years by several groups using weight bearing CT have again verified that the primary rotation is occurring distal to the posterior facet of the subtalar joint. This very recent paper by a group of orthopedic surgeons showed that it's both the anterior and middle facet of the so-called subtalar joint where the greatest reduction of coverage occurs in patients with rigid adult acquired flat foot. I think it's time that we stop talking about the subtalar joint as the most important joint of the human foot because it's really a myth. We have to realize that anatomically, 
we've always combined multiple articulations of the subtalar joint and failed to differentiate the posterior facet, which functions differently than the anterior and middle facet, as I've just shown you. The subtalar joint itself allows primarily inversion and eversion at the posterior facet but the complicated rotation of the adult acquired flat foot and probably all flat foot deformities occurs distally, not at the posterior facet. It's at the anterior and middle facet. And that axis of rotation is in the transverse plane. And that axis of rotation is most closely aligned with adult acquired flat foot. Just to review, over the past 20 years, we've learned that the subtalar joint moves only half as much as the talonavicular joint in all three cardinal planes during dynamic gait. The motion of the talonavicular joint is twice that of the subtalar joint, yet we still cling to this principle that the subtalar joint is the pivotal joint of the human foot during walking gait. Anatomically, we see these three distinct facets of the subtalar joint colored in uh, light, in turquoise, purple, and green. But we see a separation of the anterior and middle facet from the posterior facet. And that separation is known as the sinus tarsi. And within the sinus tarsi are multiple ligaments. Anatomically, the posterior facet is separate from the acetabulum pedis. The the ligaments that support the anterior middle facet are distinctly separate from the ligaments that support the posterior facet. And most importantly, the middle and anterior facet develop embryonically ahead of the posterior facet. So let's take a little deeper dive into the anatomy of this so-called acetabulum pedis and look at this all-important spring ligament the so-called superomedial calcaneal navicular ligament. This ligament connects the middle facet of the subtalar joint, not the posterior facet, the middle facet of the subtalar joint to the navicular. And it forms the floor of the acetabulum pedis. This is an interesting view of a cadaver where the talus has been removed and looking down with fluoroscopy we see this superomedial spring ligament with a, a black dot. And you can clearly see the bridge from the middle facet of the calcaneus to the navicular and how this is forming the floor of the acetabulum pedis. A cadaver photo of that same view shows over here, number one is the articular cartilage of the navicular. Number two is the articular cartilage of the middle facet of the subtalar joint, the acetabulum pedis. And number three looks like cartilage, but it's not connected to bone. This is cartilage attached to the spring ligament. This is a superomedial portion of the spring ligament, and this is the inferior portion of the spring ligament, forming the floor and medial wall of this socket, which we will now call the acetabulum pedis. From a medial view, the spring ligament is intimately connected to the deltoid ligament of the ankle joint. This is really a complex. It's very difficult when we go in surgically or if we go into a cadaver to separate all these ligaments from each other because they're all interwoven and they actually function together. Outside of the complex, number two is number one. That's the tibialis posterior tendon. So the tendon of the tibialis posterior is outside of this complex of ligaments. A recent study published in Foot and Ankle International again drives home this concept that the spring ligament rupture leads to forefoot abduction, hindfoot valgus, tibiotalar valgus, and it suggests that the spring ligament complex rupture is what leads to the breakdown of the medial side of the ankle and the hind foot, not the rupture of the posterior tibial tendon alone. 
This sequential ligament rupture leads to changes of alignment of the foot. And it's interesting that this alignment all occurs with rotation of the bones of the foot beneath the talus itself. The talus is almost a passive player in the rotation of all of the bones that lie distal. And there are surgeons who have coined this collection of bones distal to the talus, either the lamina pedis or the calcaneal pedal unit. As I'm about to show you, laxity of the spring ligament then leads to instability of the talocalcaneal navicular joint. Spring ligament rupture then causes deltoid ligament rupture. Hindfoot valgus is the result, therefore, of spring ligament rupture. And the sinus tarsi impingement and the, move, the movement of the calcaneus into extreme valgus is really the result of deltoid ligament rupture, which, by the way, is the result of spring ligament rupture. Taken one by one, clinically, when the spring ligament ruptures on x-ray, we will see this marked plantar flexion of the talus on the navicular. The support beneath this joint is lost by the loss of the superomedial calcaneal navicular ligament, the increase of so-called Miri's angle. On the anterior posterior x-ray, we see the so-called uncoverage of the head of the talus as the navicular and the entire forefoot abduct. Because of the anatomic connection, the superficial deltoid and the deep deltoid ligament then attenuate and finally rupture. And as they do, the calcaneus moves into extreme unrestricted frontal plane rotation with impingement of the uh, calcaneus against the talus within the sinus tarsi and against the fibula. This is why patients in later stage two and stage three deformity present with sinus tarsi pain and fibula pain along the gutter of the lateral ankle joint. Ligaments within the tarsal canal begin to rupture after this, specifically the cervical ligament and the interosseous talocalcaneal ligament. And when those ligaments rupture, we see both transverse plane and frontal plane subluxation of the calcaneus. On x-ray, we will see the calcaneus shift laterally, and we will see the tibia and talus shift medially. This must be controlled with the AFO brace, and I will show you how the Ritchie brace controls this particular plane of subluxation. On AP x-ray, the calcaneus begins to abduct severely under the talus, due to rupture of interosseous talocalcaneal ligament. Finally, along the medial column of the foot, we see attenuation of the ligaments supporting the first ray and first metatarsal. And as these ligaments stretch and attenuate, the first ray dorsiflexes and the medial column flattens. And the patient presents with acquired supination deformity of the forefoot on the rear foot. When we evaluate patients with adult acquired flat foot, we place the hind foot into a neutral position and the patient appears to have a forefoot varus deformity. But unlike a true forefoot varus, this supination deformity is reducible. It's reducible. It's reducible because it's acquired and it occurs due to ligamentous rupture. We must reduce this deformity when we cast the patient for a Ritchie brace because it restores the natural previous alignment of the medial arch of the foot to allow the brace to impart more biomechanical control. You should evaluate forefoot supination deformity with the patient in a prone position. This is a view of a patient with stage two deformity placing the rear foot in neutral. And as we look at the forefoot to rear foot alignment, it looks as though this patient has a very high level of forefoot varus. But note that it's completely reducible to a forefoot valgus. So it's a reducible forefoot supination deformity that should be reduced when we cast for the Ritchie brace.
So instead of casting like you do for a typical root functional orthosis, in the adult acquired flat foot, we recommend gentle pressure dorsally to reduce this acquired supinatus deformity and restore the medial longitudinal arch and restore the entire relationship of the forefoot to the rear foot in three planes. This will result in a better fitting brace, believe it or not, and a far more functional brace for the patient. So here is the, the floor of the acetabulum pedis described by the middle and anterior facet of the subtalar joint, the multiple bands of the spring ligament and the deltoid ligament complex and a socket formed by the navicular itself. Knowing this information, how does it change our own clinical evaluation and treatment of the flat foot deformity? I wanna go back to another Italian orthopedic surgeon who had a very interesting insight into this and the relationship of the acetabulum pedis and similarity to the hip joint. Pisani coined the word coxa pedis instead of acetabulum pedis to draw the connection and similarity to the hip joint and pathologies that occur in the hip joint itself. It was Pisani who really showed this clear anatomic separation of the acetabulum pedis, or as he called the coxa pedis. And note here this separation through the tarsal canal, separating the posterior facet of the subtalar joint from this new articulation complex called the coxa pedis. And he showed in an embryonic specimen how the coxa pedis and the synovial membrane of that articulation develops entirely separate from the posterior facet of the subtalar joint. Indeed, they're separate anatomically and they develop separate embryologically. Here's a photo from Pisani's paper showing how the hip joint can dislocate and become unstable just as the, the coxa pedis can. And he showed how in a flat foot deformity, it's really a dislocation of the coxa pedis, whereby the head of the talus plantar flexes and adducts while the entire uh, plate of foot bones subluxes beneath the talus. He also showed, by the way, how a congenital club foot deformity occurs at that exact same articulation. So here's a picture of the adult acquired flat foot and in Pisani's drawing, how the tibia and talus are the so-called innocent bystander while the rest of the foot subluxes around it. A group of pediatric orthopedic surgeons in 2019 embraced the concept of the acetabulum pedis and the work of Pisani and others in describing the foot's functional anatomy in all pediatric foot conditions, both club foot and flat foot deformity. Again, showing the rotation of the entire plate of foot bones beneath the tibio tailor unit. So this concept of subluxation around the talus has been embraced by very renowned pediatric orthopedic surgeons. Several of them quoted a study performed in the, uh, in, at um, Oxford University by a group of, again, pediatric orthopedic surgeons looking at the morphology of the acetabulum pedis and the subtalar joint in 84 children aged between eight and 15 years old using MRI studies. And in this study, very interesting variations of, of morphology were shown where some children have a well-developed anterior middle facet. Some children have a confluence of the two facets. Some children have only a large middle facet and some children completely lack an anterior facet. These authors proposed that the entire stability of the foot is affected by the malformation or failure of development of the all important anterior and middle facets of the acetabulum pedis. Other research, researchers have looked at specimens 
of uh, stillborn children and again shown variations of the three facets of the calcaneus and further speculated that these variations related to the development of the arch of the foot. Depending on the level of flat foot deformity and even comparing African adults versus European adults, there seems to be a difference in the shape of the anterior middle facet of the acetabulum pedis. The three facet joint form has been proposed as offering a stronger support for both running and jumping, giving an advantage for athletic performance. Whereas the lack of development of the anterior middle facet has been proposed to be linked to instability and perhaps development of flat foot deformity. One final study, I already showed you this earlier, came to those exact same conclusions, looking at necropsies of stillborn infants and marked variation of the development of the acetabulum pedis. Even after birth, we know that the talus continues to mature and develop as the infant foot grows. And significant changes occur in the talus from age five months to the 12 year old or adult foot, where the head and neck of the talus rotate in the transverse plane, moving it closer to alignment of the navicular, and the head and neck of the talus rotate in the frontal plane from age five months to adult. These developmental rotations assure restoration of alignment of the head and neck of the talus to the navicular. It is intriguing to think that some children fail to abduct and continue to rotate the head of the talus laterally to achieve a normal talonavicular joint angle. And that some children, the, the head and neck of the talus do not articulate properly with the navicular. I've shown you several experts who have proposed that this is the predisposing uh, beginning of the adult acquired flat foot deformity and perhaps related to failure of development of the anterior middle facet of the so-called talocalcaneo navicular joint or the acetabulum pedis. Keep in mind that the navicular is the last bone of the human foot to ossify. It doesn't really fully ossify until approximately three to four years of age, depending on boys or girls. So it's undergoing maturation from pure cartilage to bone, as we see in this progressive radiograph. And it's interesting to speculate what influences could be applied to the foot during these three critical years of development as the talus and navicular begin to align to each other and form the acetabulum pedis. Keep in mind, as we look at the coxa pedis and the relationship to the hip, we know that a well-known disorder detected at birth, the congenital dysplasia of the hip, must be detected early on to avoid progressive degenerative arthritis and disability of that child as they grow to adulthood. The hip joint must be in proper alignment in order for the ligaments to mature and form a stable hip joint complex. Infants who have a dysplasia and a shallow hip socket without treatment will go on and form a unstable hip that will have rapid degenerative arthritis in early adulthood. It is important to detect dysplasia of the hip socket in a newborn infant because immediate treatment will restore the alignment of that socket and allow it to mature normally. I propose that we begin to look at this acetabulum pedis of the foot in a similar way and question whether malformation of that joint detected early could possibly be treated. I'm not saying that we know how to treat it and we have no evidence that treatment can correct it, but I think it's time to begin looking at it. Because just a matter of weeks or even months with a simple flexible brace in a newborn can, re can restore alignment of a unstable hip joint and assure that it develops normally. <laughs>
Up until now, most orthopedic surgeons scoff at the idea of using foot orthotics in asymptomatic children with flat foot deformity because in short-term studies, there's no evidence that it changes the shape of the foot. But there are no long-term studies to determine how these external interventions might influence development of the foot or prevent problems later in life. We do know surgically, if we insert implants into the rear foot, so-called subtalar arthroresis in a growing child and leave it in for three or four years and then take it out, the restoration of alignment is maintained into adulthood. Temporary restoration of alignment in a growing child with a surgical implant will lead to permanent establishment of stability of the arch of the foot, which is maintained even after the implant is removed. This is well known now in the pediatric surgical circles. The question is, can we use external devices on the growing child to achieve the same result? We don't have any evidence thus far that that can happen, but I think it's time we start looking at it. So my proposal is that we need to study this talocalcaneal navicular joint in infants, as already has been done with MRI imaging. And we want to learn with longitudinal studies whether that joint fails to develop in certain children, causing instability and progressive flat foot later in life. We really need longitudinal studies well beyond three to four years in order to do this and really go on and see them in age 30, 40, and 50 if they develop the progressive collapsing foot deformity. And finally, we need longitudinal, longitudinal studies of treatment effects with external supports, AFO bracing, perhaps even foot orthoses that may prevent progression of these certain feet to the adult acquired flat foot. So one thing I can tell you, one take home is that you might wanna start evaluating pediatric patients for preexisting joint instability because there's evidence that this joint is unstable at an early age and you may be able to detect it. And there is a test that at least is valuable in adult patients and it is valuable to perform even in pediatric patients. It was developed by Chandra Pasapula, who I correspond with regularly and he's a, he and I have collaborated on a manuscript that is now under review in an orthopedic surgical journal basically proposing everything that I just shared with you in this lecture. But Pasapula developed a test for spring ligament insufficiency. And it's an interesting, simple test, which he calls the neutral heel lateral push test. Basically, the examiner stabilizes the rear foot and holds their one hand along the lateral wall of the calcaneus. And then with the other hand, you abduct the forefoot on the rear foot. You're moving the forefoot on the rear foot in the transverse plane. And you compare one foot to the other. In the adult, many times this insufficiency shows unilateral. And so you will see a marked difference between the right and left foot. On x-ray, you can see the lateral push test absolutely opens up the talonavicular joint complex. Pasapula made this interesting video for me showing a patient of his who has a very unstable acetabulum pedis, but doesn't have rupture of the posterior tibial tendon. This patient can easily perform a single foot heel rise on both right and left foot. But as we'll see in the lateral push test, they have a marked difference in stability of their spring ligament. On the right foot, it's stable. On the left foot, a very profound transverse plane instability. Right foot is stable. Left foot, profound transverse plane instability. When was this, could this have been detected? Perhaps even as a growing child, and it's worth doing in all of your patients.
So to make this relevant as I want to just briefly for the Ritchie brace, and then we're gonna open it up for discussion. I just wanna show you the adult acquired flat foot and this peritalar subluxation that occurs around the tibia and the talus. And what's quite interesting, and I've lectured on this for 20 years, this three-dimensional rotation follows exactly the rotation of the twisted plate originally proposed by, of all people, an Irish. I love giving this lecture to Irish podiatrists. One of the most brilliant biomechanists I've ever read named um, Matt, uh, Michael McConnell. And he published this paper way back in 1944 describing this complex three-dimensional rotation of the bones of the human foot and how the tibia and the talus rotate and either twist the plate of bones or untwist the plate of bones. And as we look at the twisting of the plate of bones and the rotation of the tibia, we realize that as the tibia and, and talus internally rotate, the rear foot pronates and the forefoot supinate. That's entirely the linkage of motions of the breakdown of the adult acquired flat foot. Indeed, looking at this patient whose right foot is symptomatic, the tibia and the fibula are markedly internally rotated on the plate of bones of the foot exactly at the talonavicular joint complex. Look how anteriorly rotated the fibula is on her right foot compared to her left. In this less obvious finding, the fibula malleolus is anterior on the patient's left foot than the right foot. The bulging of the navicular from internal rotation of the tibia and talus, or we could think about it, the external rotation of the lamina pedis or, um, or, or uh, foot plate of bones. So if we wanna correct that deformity, we want to achieve all of these three-dimensional motions of the foot. And as I believe, and I've learned with the Ritchie brace, the best way to do it is start here with the tibia. Because if we can externally rotate the tibia, we can externally rotate the talus. And through the linkage mechanism of the foot, the rear foot will uh, invert or supinate, and the forefoot will pronate and reduce forefoot supinatus deformity. So here is the untwisted plate, according to McConnell, and here is the twisted plate, and it's initiated by external rotation of the tibia. The talus follows the tibia. The talus is carried passively in all ankle joint motions because no muscle attaches to the talus. It's passively controlled by motion of the tibia above. And so as the, the talus is adducted and internally rotated by the tibia. So we take a foot like this, we have marked subluxation of the foot beneath the talus and the tibia, and we want to restore that. We have several levels that we can achieve that at. The Ritchie brace has limb supports strategically placed lateral and medial to the entire lower leg. And by tightening a posterior strap as tight as possible against the medial and lateral aspects, we can now control and establish a strong lever arm to control internal and external rotation of the tibia and fibula. And in so doing, we control internal and external rotation of the talus. We know this is true because we did a kinematic study at the University of Massachusetts with Chris McLean. And indeed, looking at all segments of the foot and the leg, it was the tibial rotation that was most profound with this black line of the Ritchie brace compared to the unbraced condition. But we also believe through the foot plate of the Ritchie brace and these uprights, we can prevent this medial subluxation of the tibia and talus over the calcaneus. So we wanna restrain both internal rotation of the tibia, but that medial displacement of the talus, and finally control abduction of the forefoot with the design of the foot plate itself of the Ritchie brace.
So here is the adult acquired flat foot, hairy tailor subluxation of the bones around the talus, application of the Ritchie brace to prevent medial shift of the tibia and talus over the calcaneus, inversion of the calcaneus with a medial sky of the foot plate, and what we can't see here, prevention of transverse plane rotation of the tibia fibular complex. So we can take a foot like this and in three dimensions, restore alignment with a properly fitted brace and with proper footwear. This is what the end result is. This is a patient with stage three, severe subluxation deformity, is in significant pain, is in her early 80s and unable to tolerate the stress of severe reconstructive foot and ankle surgery. And so we fit her for a Ritchie brace. And in this case, we will see the immediate restoration of alignment. But more importantly, this patient became pain-free within a matter of weeks and avoided what would otherwise be debilitating surgery. So with a almost 25-year track, uh, track record, the application of the Ritchie brace and the proper ap application and understanding the mechanics of the foot and ankle has enabled us to restore mobility to thousands of patients and avoid surgery in all three planes. And as I've shown in previous lectures, there are multiple studies showing that at least 50% of patients with proper AFO bracing can avoid surgery and even move out of their brace and be well controlled with simple functional foot orthotics after one year of AFO bracing. Why do they become pain-free? And why can they often discard their AFO brace? We believe that ligaments heal everywhere in the foot and ankle not just the athlete who sprains an ankle and the ligaments heal. We think the spring ligament and the deltoid ligament can heal with proper bracing and that the majority of these patients can become pain-free. The deformity will still persist, but they won't have the pain from the painful subluxation of the joints. This patient who I showed in an earlier slide was treated with a Ritchie brace 20 years ago, and I followed her in my practice. She only wore the Ritchie brace on the right side for one year, and then she moved into a custom foot orthosis. This is the same patient 20 years later. Her feet still looks terribly sublux, but they're not painful. She can walk up to a mile every day for exercise without pain with proper shoes and proper foot orthoses. While her feet still look bad, she avoided surgery and she's carried out an active lifestyle. And so this is the picture 20 years later, but the big difference is she never had to have surgery. And that to us is a, is a very positive outcome and one that we expect for most patients treated with adult acquired flat foot. Thank you very much for your attention. I know I shared a lot of information uh, and I'm uh, anxious to take any questions you may have. So I'm going to open this up to Martin and let him uh, field the questions. Okay, Doug, thank you very much for that. Um, if anybody has any questions, please pop them into the little chat and I can pass them on to, uh, to Doug. Um, I think, Doug, uh, acetabulum pedis, that's, uh, that was the fascinating thing that struck me when you presented that in the Lake District at Zoe Wilson's um, uh, ZW Academy meeting. Um, there's a high level of magnification there when you get really into the nitty gritty of the anatomy of the foot and ankle. And maybe for a lot of us, it you know means we need to get back to the textbooks a little bit. So, um, yeah, I highly recommend... Uh, Doug's book, which really goes into this in detail. So that is uh, The Pathomechanics of Common Foot Disorders by Springer Publishing or at Springer Publishing. Yes, uh, everybody will get a copy of the um, presentation tonight. Doug, there's one question here is someone's asking, I think it's Rachel, is it possible to get a copy of the PowerPoint presentation? Sure, um, I'll put that into a PDF form, Martin, and I'll 
provided for you and you can distribute it to the attendees? Yeah, okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, yes, Doug has also agreed that uh, his, this, this be recorded and it will be put up on our website for people to view it at a later date. Um, so anybody got any questions from uh, that would like to be directed either to myself or to Doug Ritchie? Please just type them in there. Nothing jumping in at the moment. Maybe you have a question, Martin. Oh, here's, here's one here. Um, from uh, Tim Kilmartin is with us. So he's saying, Doug, could you give us some advice on how to deal with patients who find it difficult to comply with the Ritchie brace? Yeah, um, I, I think the two primary challenges with compliance, the first is footwear. Um, and, and as we know, uh, a significant portion of patients with adult acquired flat foot are female. And fashion comes into play, and the and um, fashionable footwear is generally not compatible with the Ritchie brace. But neither is the adult acquired flat foot. I, no matter what treatment you undertake for uh, the severe collapsing flat foot, it almost mandates the patient go into a lace-up Oxford shoe. And so, I, I always, when I meet a patient for the first time with adult acquired flat foot it's really an educational process to let them know that it's gonna require a permanent lifestyle change in their selection of footwear. And that sometimes is a barrier uh, for some patients. Number two, the brace itself, while it fits most of the time, these are severe pathologies, they're dynamic, they're progressive, they're ever-changing, and it requires adjustment of the brace. And there are periods where maybe uh, there's irritation of the medial malleolus, perhaps the medial arch that, uh, that the clinician's going to have to be skilled in doing adjustments, perhaps wedging areas of the brace, uh, sending it back to the lab, perhaps for modifications. Fortunately, that doesn't occur real often, but it does occur, and you have to be prepared to do that. Um, so I, I will say this. I believe that any tolerance of the Ritchie brace is solvable. Uh, I've never met a patient who, quote, couldn't tolerate a Ritchie brace. Uh, I, I think with work, we could always solve whatever issues there were. Okay, thanks for that. I think I would add a really Doug, and um, the complexity of it and what type of problem the person's having. Um, yeah, okay, there's, let me see, there's... Uh, there's a little comment from Penny saying, thank you. Your presentation book, Doug, have completely changed my practice. Um, <laughs> this is a question then directed at me from Debbie saying, Martin, are you running any courses on Richie Brace prescription manufacturer? Um, I think we're looking at some for probably in London. So watch again the professional journal and we'll probably run a Richie Brace workshop in London, which is probably easy for a lot of the patients are podiatrist in that area in south, south of England to get to. Um, there's another comment here saying that, uh, from it just says from iPhone saying that I find men comply better than women with Ritchie braces. Um, here's one from Tim. What are the implications of acetabulum pedis for the surgical management of adult acquired flat foot? Can we move away from medial column and rear foot fusions? Question mark. Yeah, you know, that's a great question, Tim. Um, and and that really is what uh, Dr. Pasapula and I have been discussing from our own experience in that with the advent of new technologies where we can repair and augment the spring ligament, uh, specifically with the, um, with the internal brace mechanism provided by Arthrex in particular, where we can reconstruct the spring ligament and not have, certainly not have to do a fusion procedure on the medial column, and perhaps not necessarily have to do lateral column lengthening or medial displacement calcaneal osteotomy. Um, the, the bottom line is, <clears throat> now that we understand how these bones rotate, 
I think we really have to go right to that talonavicular joint complex and get these bones back in place underneath that joint, certainly with osteotomies and not with fusions, and then perhaps augmenting those damaged soft tissue structures the best we can. And I, I think we're going to be seeing better technologies develop over the next five years as other surgical companies come up with ways to augment the spring ligament complex. Thank you, Doug. Um, I just want to go back to that little question, Tim, that you posed earlier, which was that idea of, you know, what happens when patients can't tolerate a Ritchie brace. I mean, we regularly modify braces. Sometimes they're only minor modifications, but sometimes they also involve heat spotting. And uh, as Doug said, footwear advice is key. I also think advising the patient from the word go that, for instance, in this case, if we're talking about, uh, um, you know, adult quad flat foot, um, you're looking at wearing this for 12 months as the ligaments heal and, and setting the scene for them progressing from rich, a Richie Brace mechanical therapy into custom-made foot orthoses. Um, I think it's, it's an educational process and you know the patient then buys into, okay, I'm going to wear this for 12 months. You definitely have, have to advise them on footwear. Um, you have to also engage them in... Uh, strength and condition and rehabilitation, work with physios. I mean, all of the usual stuff that we do in podiatric sports medicine. Um, I think if you simply prescribe them a Ritchie brace, um, you know, and you don't educate the patient sufficiently, you will run into problems. Simple things like, you know, if you've got ankle swelling, what's going to happen? Is that going to, you know, how is that going to irritate at the front of the ankle when you've got the Velcro straps? What do you, you know, you need to wear longer socks. You know that we can adjust the inside padding from a you know standard fitted padding to a thicker fitted padding. There's all sorts of things that can be done, um, and I think sometimes patients run out of patience with it and they you know throw in the towel, so to speak. Yeah, that's a uh, great point, Martin. I appreciate you bringing all of that up. And you know, in a previous lecture that I did for Firefly, and I think it's recorded and on your website. I showed how we often take these patients through a continuum. And just like an athlete with an acute ankle sprain, we don't put them in a Ritchie brace initially. We treat them with an acute injury with perhaps a walking boot with a compression wrap. Uh, we, we have to reduce the edema and get them out of their pain before we brace them. Um, and often I will strap or wrap a patient's foot with a Ritchie brace to keep the edema down until the acute condition has progressed more to the chronic healing, just like we see in an ankle sprain. Yeah, I think another point there is that we've seen over a period of time, a lot of referrals for Richie Brace rehabilitation. Now we've led that because initially we thought that Richie Braces were a product that you would use, well, forever. Uh, now I realize that the ligaments do heal. And um, we've seen a lot of referrals from foot and ankle orthopedic surgeons who want us to use the Ritchie brace to get the people mobile and back to activity um, while they're uh, recovering. And, and these patients may only use the Ritchie brace for two to three months, and then they're out of that and into uh, custom-made foot orthoses or simply straight into footwear. It depends on the patient. Um, so that's just something to bear in mind. Um, there's another little comment here from Colin O'Neill. Uh, he says, women comply for the short term, then fashion takes over. Um, and, and certainly that's a point. Once pain disappears, you know, people may want to come out of the brace. Um, although, again, you can design the brace with a lower heel cup. And um, I know that, uh, you know, we had a patient that came to our Belfast clinic, well, probably 15 years ago. And uh, had a adult quad flat foot, got a Richie brace, standard heel cup, it's 35 millimeter heel, you know, 35 millimeter heel cup. And we also had a three millimeter heel lift on it to sort of try and help with the ankle equinus at the time. And uh, she then came back with a pair of Prada shoes and said, right, okay, I want a brace to fit these. And uh, we designed one with a 15 millimeter heel cup, a first ray cutout, and she was able to wear that in Prada shoes. So you can change the design of the product and still have the effect of joint coupling. Um, yeah, so there, there's different ways to do it. 
Let me just see if there's another question here, Doug. Um, uh, this one's from Penny. In your experience, have you had to add many arch sus suspension uh, add-ons to your devices you've previously prescribed? Um, so that's really the medial arch suspender that Penny's talking about. And the question, Doug, is have you, in many occasions, have to add that to an existing Ritchie brace? The answer, the short answer is no. Um, uh, I, I rarely had to add it uh, retrospectively. Um, and I, I guess I was, I got good at knowing which patient was going to need it from the outset. But generally, I only was using the medial arch suspender for stage three, you know, more rigid, non-reducible deformity, particularly those patients with a severe subluxation of the talonavicular joint that were actually getting callusing or even ulcerative changes under the head of the talus. I would always use the arch suspender, but <clears throat> you know, the majority of my patients over my 25 year career using the Ritchie brace with adult acquired flat foot, I would say 80% did not need it and never uh, did I ever use an arch suspender. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I think that there was a period when I dabbled with the lateral arch suspender and the medial arch suspender. And of course, then you have to fix the ankle hinge, which means the double rivet so that you don't allow plantar flexion, dorsiflexion of the ankle. Um, so I have kind of found over the years that I've, I've moved away from that because the solid five mil polypropylene really offloads the medial lateral side of the foot, depending on what type of pathology you're trying to treat, rather than the softer medial or lateral arch suspender. Um, yeah, so hopefully that answers the question. Um, Penny, um, yeah, Penny, you were on that uh, ZW Academy uh, weekend retreat. And um, it's interesting for me to observe you in your clinical practice adding um, Ritchie Brace therapy to it and to see how you're now treating much more complex pathologies, um, which includes foot drop um, and some of those really awful lateral unstable ankle OA problems. So yeah, and, and it is a learning curve. And what you find, everyone listening, is that you're, you know, you, you can reach out to Doug at any point, and of course to myself and the other technical support team in Firefly. So quite often we're sharing videos on WhatsApp of right, what am I going to do with this patient? How am I going to modify this? What are these shoes like? Will it work in this shoe? Will it not? What's the specific hinge for this pathology? Um, yeah, uh, I think you know there's a good resource team there to really help out. So don't hesitate to, to give uh, to give everybody a shout. Now, let me just see, there's a couple of things that come in. Yeah, Penny was on that course. Yeah, and that, yeah, you were treating an 80, 84 year old and she's doing really well. He's walking to shop again every day to fetch his newspaper. Yeah, there you go. That was a, an older guy that uh, could no longer walk to get his newspaper. Simple stuff, Doug, but it's it's, it's pretty life-changing product. And for those that of us that use it and use it regularly now, you see that, um, you know, uh, especially foot drop. We always talk about out of car flat foot, but I mean, foot drop's one of the one of the key ones that it's so affected with, you know. Um, okay, look, folks, it's nearly 20 past nine. Um, I don't think there's any more questions. So I just want to say a huge thanks to Doug. Uh, for joining us from uh, California. And a huge thanks to everybody who attended tonight. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, have a great evening. Okay. Cheers. Okay. Thank Bye. you, Martin. Okay. <laughs> Bye -bye.